Hi, it's Robin. Today we're going to be looking at Bruce Lee by Datasoft. Bruce Lee was one of the earlier games for the Commodore 64, released in 1984 after originally appearing on the Atari 800. But even though it's an early game, it's a very popular game. On GameBase 64, it's ranked as the number 5 game out of the top 100. Number one is a bit suspicious there, by the way, but otherwise the list looks pretty good. And number 21 on Lemon 64. This has long been a favorite of mine. I even had a tradition where every New Year's I would play and finish Bruce Lee. So today I'm going to be going through all the trivia, secrets, bugs, whatever you want to call them, I know about Bruce Lee. I've never seen all this compiled together. A bit of this is my own original research, and a lot of it I've picked up on the internet over the years. So I'm just going to try and bring it all together. If you already know everything that's in this video, then why didn't you make it so I didn't have to? So Bruce Lee is actually one of a quadrilogy of games, at least in my opinion. All these games are by Datasoft. They all feature licensed characters or movie properties, and they're all platform games with a slight puzzle element. So if you like one of these games, there's a good chance you'll like all of them. Not that they're all clones of each other. Each one has its unique flavor. And of course, some people prefer one over the other. Definitely Bruce Lee is the most popular of the lot. But these four games are all favorites of mine. So besides Bruce Lee, I'm fortunate enough to have Conan. There's Arnie on the front. There's Zorro. And one of my all-time favorite movies and games, The Goonies. Take a closer look at the box art. There's Bruce Lee climb up a ladder. There's actually many Bruce Lees here. <laughs> fighting ninjas. Fighting the green yammo. And of course, climbing things and generally fighting. So, I also have the manual. And here's the disc with the extremely shiny label. It's got the Commodore 64 version on one side, and on the back side is the Atari version. So, we'll load it up here. Even before you start the game, there's a few oddities here, such as if you try to load the disc directory, It'll actually just spin forever. And if you hit stop and try to list that directory, that's what you get. <laughs> if you use a DOS wedge, this is what you get back. So what's going on here? If we pop into the Super Snapshot Monitor, use the U1 command, to load the disk directory. We can take a look at the structure here. So if you check out my animated disk directory video, I go a lot deeper into how Commodore disk directories work. I won't go deep on it now, but basically the first two bytes are a pointer. I loaded track one, two hex, sector zero, and the first two bytes of the sector point to the next one, which is 12, one. That's pretty standard. So if I load 12.1, and then we take a look at that one, you see here, 12.1 points back to 12.1. This disk directory is invalid. It purposely has an infinite loop that will cause your disk drive to just try and read forever. It almost seems like that should be illegal, but anyway, that's what they did. It. I suppose it was in the name of copy protection. Now, if we restart the computer and try to load the game with my Super Snapshot cartridge active, it deliberately hangs up. And I think this happens with any fast load cartridge of the time. Even though the game doesn't actually have much of a fast loader at all, it takes a few minutes to load off disk. I think it has none, in fact. So it seems that they deliberately blocked people from using their fast loader cartridges. And after it freezes, you actually have to power cycle the drive and the computer to get it to boot. 
So I'll use the F8 function to just disable the snapshot. And then we'll load it, comma 8, comma 1. Like I said, this takes a few minutes. I'll fast forward it. Datasoft presents Bruce Lee, copyright 1984, programmed by Ron J. Fortier. We'll see his initials again soon. Game graphics, copyright 1984 Datasoft. TM designates a trademark of Linda Lee, that's Bruce Lee's widow. When I first saw this title screen in 1984, I thought that was amazing. To me, it looked like, like a real photo <laughs> to my 11 or 12 year old eyes. I had never seen graphics quite like that before. I, admittedly, I was, uh, I don't think I'd seen a lot of the world. I want to be on the record as I love this game, but today I am going to be pointing out some of its quirks and faults. A shout out to Amiga Love for pointing out that directory oddity to me on Twitter early this year. Still loading. So now that the game started, you can see some of its Atari roots with this double wide font that Datasoft Presents Bruce Lee by Ron J. Fortier is printed in. Now, if you press F3 and F5, you can toggle between four different game modes. So one player versus the computer is obvious. If you press F5, it's actually a two player game where the second player controls green Yamo. And I can demonstrate that. There he is. You can either attack Bruce Lee, or you can just try to take out that ninja instead. If you pull down, it's like he yells or something. F1 to go back to the title screen. And if you press F3, there's a two player mode where one player is Bruce Lee. And then when Bruce Lee dies, you go to the second player who also plays as Bruce Lee. Or there's another mode where you can alternate Bruce Lee and Yamo on alternate lives. Also hidden on the title screen, if you press L, it'll actually set joystick one to left-handed mode. And you can set that back by pressing R to set to right-handed mode. If you hold shift L, joystick two will go in left-handed mode and shift R will set joystick two to right-handed mode. So if we set joystick one to left-handed mode and start the game, up in the top corner, you'll see it says L. And if you push right on the joystick, Bruce Lee Ducks. Well, that's because you're supposed to hold the joystick rotated 90 degrees. I'm, I'm attempting to play left-handed here. <laughs> there we go. Well, that's an odd little feature, which must have been useful in the early 80s when everybody had Atari-style joysticks without the second button here. Don't hit back. Another hidden command is if you press V, and up at the top there, it says Bruce Lee, copyright 1984 Datasoft, revision 3 by RJF, Ron J. Forche. Revision 3, as far as I can tell, is the final version, but I have located version 1 and 2. Version 1, I actually have this pirated copy. This is the copy of Bruce Lee I got way back, probably 1985, and it is version one. And version two, I didn't have a copy of either official or pirated, but it's very easy to find online. Version two, in fact, seems to be the most common. And I think if you had bought Bruce Lee on tape in the UK, then you probably ended up with a version two. Now, I haven't done a comprehensive study of the differences, but there does seem to be one major difference that we'll get to shortly. Another interesting feature of the game, and I'll fast forward this so you can see it, that if you leave the game unattended long enough, the game will pause and then enter an Atari-style rotating color scheme. 
This was very common on Atari 2600 games and carried through to a lot of 8-bit computer Atari games as well, which, as I said, was where Bruce Lee originated. So that feature was carried over. Of course, it's not going to do as many colors as the Atari 8-bits could do, but still the same general principle of changing the common color registers to produce this early form of screensaver to attempt to avoid screen burn-in. Now, speaking of Atari, here's an interesting bug that I first learned about on the Atari version. Okay, here I've got my Atari 1200XL, probably the most rare of all the Atari 8-bit computers, mainly because it wasn't very well received. So they didn't, they actually just didn't make that many. I'm having a bit of trouble with my floppy drive for it. So instead of writing the disk version, I borrowed this Atari Max flash cartridge from my friend Darren Folds. Thanks, Darren. Oh, we'll just start Bruce Lee here, item number seven. Oh, well, that's glitchy. So here's Bruce Lee for the Atari. Just press start to begin the game. That looks a lot like the Commodore 64 version. I just want to show you a strange glitch that only, as far as I know, only the Atari version has. If we head down here to the bottom of the third level, and then climb up onto this, if we just go there, we can get Bruce Lee hung up very easily. And the game is totally frozen, like, I mean, obviously not frozen, but it's, it's locked up. You can't control them anymore. And it's like an infinite loop. Okay, and if you happen to do it just right, that same bug. Okay, here we go. And I'll try and freeze up here. Oh, no. Oh, there, I'm hung up again. Well, that's one possibility. They'll just kind of keep attacking him while he's hung up there. But they never managed to hit him. Or we'll try one more time here. There we go. <laughs> so you can get this in this endless loop where you're just continually knocking down your enemies, falling on them, and you see how the score keeps going up. And it's a little harder to reproduce, but there's another one where the score will go up a lot quicker. I'll show some footage I captured of that. I didn't have the camera running, but I did have the capture device running, where the score counts up really quickly, and you can actually just wrap the game. You get a million points, it goes back to zero, after 999999. And uh, your number of falls keeps going up. But unfortunately, you can't make good use of that. Bruce Lee is just hung up and frozen. So I thought that bug was exclusive to the Atari, but it turns out you can actually duplicate it really easily on the C64. Look at that. Bruce is just hung up there and no longer responds to controls. He just keeps flapping his arms forever there. So it turns out the C64 version's probably just as buggy as the Atari version. It's funny I never encountered that in all the years I've played the C64 version. A couple months ago, I was watching an episode of RMC. As Neil was talking, he showed some footage of Bruce Lee running on the Amstrad. And it amazed me when Bruce Lee suddenly went through a wall. So I reached out to Neil to see if he could explain that, and very kindly he agreed to. So here he is. So Bruce Lee on the Amstrad CPC I found to be terribly confusing because on the surface it's a very simple game. You collect the lanterns, the doors unlock, it's a lock and key situation, and you go into the next chamber. I think there's 20 chambers or so in total, that's what it says on here, 20 secret chambers. But it wasn't that simple on the Amstrad CPC. It was terribly confusing for me because... If you go to the right hand side of the screen, and the first instance of this is on the third screen, and duck into the wall like this, you go through the wall. You bypass the whole lock and key situation. And that's not the only place it happens. It happens time and time and time again. It's clearly a bug in the Amstrad version because when I tried this on the Commodore 64 it didn't happen. And what I found is it only happens on the right hand side of the screen, and it only happens if in the next screen, there's not a wall on the left-hand side. So you've got a wall 
on the first screen but not a wall in the second screen. If that's the situation, you can just duck and you go through the wall. Brilliant. How did they not discover that in testing? How, because it's not just one occasion, it's every single situation where there's not a wall in the second screen. Duck and you go through it. And I've seen so much more of this game as a kid than I ever should have done, than I ever had the skill to see. <laughs> I got into so many chambers just by going through the walls. So there you have it. The uh, Amstrad CPC version of Bruce Lee is buggy as hell. And I loved it. <laughs> I suspect many of you already subscribed to RMC, but if you haven't, definitely check out his channel. I've learned a lot about computer history from him, particularly the UK machines that we didn't have here. So later in the game, if you go down this corridor, there's some symbols, and if you pick those up, you get an extra fall. That is an extra Bruce Lee. <laughs> so it turns out that if you actually go in and out of that room, you can collect that five times. So just in case you didn't notice that, Make sure on that level you go in as many times as you can. By the way, if you finish the game and get back to that room a second time, then there are no extra lives given in that room. So if you do finish the game, then the game starts over. And when I was a kid, I never did play that again because I thought, well, I've already beaten it. But it turns out the game actually gets more difficult. The most obvious thing is that the respawn time for the Black Ninja and the Green Yamo is eliminated. So they immediately appear on the screen and this makes several levels much more difficult because there they are already attacking you the moment you start the level. The other major change is that on this last level, all the safe spots are removed. So Bruce Lee is constantly in danger as you try and navigate this level. In fact, I have never managed to get through this screen to finish the second playthrough. It's really difficult. Now the Bruce Lee disc has surprisingly strong copy protection. In fact, I've never managed to make a working copy off this original disc. It uses something called weak bits or bad GCR. That's group coded recording. And essentially, they've deliberately recorded invalid sequence of bits on the disk, which will cause a seemingly random bit to be returned when that part of the disk is read. So the program just checks. It just repeatedly reads that and makes sure that it's getting different bits back. If it keeps getting the same bit back over and over again, it knows that it's a copy because the drive itself is incapable of duplicating that incorrect sequence. That's a simple version of it anyway. Bruce Lee actually appeared in another famous C64 game, but he wasn't credited. And that game is Way of the Exploding Fist, which is a very famous karate C64 game. Even the name Way of the Exploding Fist is very likely a reference to Bruce Lee's own martial arts style, which he called Jeet Kune Do, which, sorry for my pronunciation, is Cantonese for the way of the intercepting fist. But that famous scream that's played when the way of the exploding fist starts is actually Bruce Lee while he's performing a flying jump kick in the movie Enter the Dragon. Back in the 2000s, I was a regular on a website called Lemon64, which is still going today. There would be discussions about Bruce Lee, and people would often say that the game crashed on them a lot. Now, I never noticed the game crash, and I had finished it dozens of times. Eventually, I realized it was all people from Europe, from Australia, who had PAL Commodore 64s. So to demonstrate it, here's my PAL C64. Again, thanks to my friend Maker Valp for getting this for me. This is the Swedish Commodore 64. So this is version one of the game, and I've chosen it because it does seem to be the most crashy. But apparently version two 
will crash as well. I'm not sure about version 3. Okay, got through the first three levels with no crash. Here we're on the fourth level. There we go. End of the fourth level, the game just freezes. So we're not talking about that other crash up against the ladder or whatever where Bruce Lee gets hung up. This is a very different crash. It happens whenever you... Well, it doesn't happen whenever, but the only time it seems to happen is when you transition from one room to the next. And that's it. It's crashed. Okay, but... If you happen to have a super snapshot or other freezer cartridge, you can often fix it. I press the freezer button, and then I just press resume. And now the game is fixed, at least for now. Okay, and it can also happen when you die and it restarts the level. It'll freeze. Once again, just press the button and resume, and we're back in business. So, what's going on here? So if we go into the monitor, there's a number of instances of code, and we'll look at this one here. Now there's quite a few places in the code where the A register is loaded from D011, and that's either anded or ORed to turn one or more bits on or off. In this case, AND EF will turn off bit 4. If we look at the C64 Programmer's Reference Guide, bit 4 is to blank the screen, which probably happens between each level and then it's stored back into D011. This pattern's actually shown in the C64 Programmer's Reference Guide, where you, even in BASIC, you peak the register, you modify and store it back in. However, this register, D011 or 53265 in decimal, the high or seventh bit is actually the raster compare the bit 8 of it. There's a 9-bit register which, when read, tells the current raster line being drawn, but when written, tells the video chip when to generate an interrupt on what raster line. And this is the high bit of it. So this pattern will cause the current high bit of the raster value to be loaded, which may be 0, which may be 1. When you're past raster line 255, it'll be set to 1, and then modifies it for some purpose, like screen blanking. But then when it's stored back in, it's actually telling the VIC-2 to cause an interrupt after raster line 255. And if that is combined with a value in D012, which is the main 8 bits, that's high enough, you're essentially telling the VIC-2 to generate a raster interrupt on a line that does not exist. And therefore, the interrupt will never happen. And if the code is expecting the interrupt to happen, the game will freeze. So essentially, the game is waiting for an interrupt that will never happen. Then when you use the super snapshot, part of that process involves rewriting those registers. And that unlocks it, essentially. And the reason the crash is so much more common on PAL machines is that with 312 scan lines, there's a significant number of scan lines that are beyond line 255, while NTSC machines only have 262 scan lines. So there's a far smaller chance of that ninth bit being set when D011 is read and then accidentally written back in to cause an interrupt beyond line 255. Now, I'm not saying this exact bit of code is the cause of the problem. There's many reads and writes to D011 throughout the code base. I'm not sure exactly which ones are causing the problem, but that is the pattern that's causing the problem. Part of why I haven't looked into it more is that it's actually fixed. The excellent fixer cracker Jack Alien did an excellent version of Bruce Lee that fixes this bug. 
and released it through his group, Remember. So if you're looking to play Bruce Lee, grab the Remember crack. And one other bug I've heard about but wasn't able to reproduce, viewer Jeff Flowers left a comment about how he and his brother used to play Bruce Lee, and they could do the long-distance punch where Bruce Lee could punch an enemy even though he was far away. Now, that might be the same problem, or that might be the same bug that accidentally got replicated when I was playing as Green Yamo earlier in this video. But if somebody can reproduce that, that'd be really cool. So I just wanted to give a, a shout out to Jeff there. Thanks for your comment. I'm sorry I couldn't reproduce that. Maybe another viewer will figure that out. I'm also curious, does anybody have a version of Bruce Lee besides these three versions? All right, if you haven't subscribed already, please do consider it. Also, a big thank you to my patrons who support the channel. If you're interested in becoming a patron, then check out the link in the description below to see what sort of benefits there are. All right, thanks for watching. We'll talk to you next time. Ninja, Barbarian, Wonder Boy, I can't